Welcome to Questions That Matter, a podcast of the C.S. Lewis Institute. I'm your host, Randy Newman. We pursue discipleship of the heart and mind. We try to think as deeply and as Christianly as C.S. Lewis thought about everything. And I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, Jess Archer, and we're going to explore a theme in her book, uh, the theme of finding home. Jess, welcome to Questions That Matter. Thank you. It's so fun to be here. Well, people need to hear the title of this book first and then dig in and hear some more about your story. But I love the title. It's called Finding Home with the Beatles, Bob Dylan, and Billy Graham. And the subtitle is A Memoir of Growing Up Inside the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. So we've got to hear a little bit of the backstory. What's your connection to Billy Graham? Yeah, well, I like to say he's the voice of my conscience, uh, <laughs> mostly because he was the the central figurehead of my childhood. My father was the director for Billy Graham's North American Crusades for 25 years. Uh, mm. from, from the time I was three till the time I was about, you know, in my twenties. So it spanned my father's job with Billy Graham spanned the entire course of my childhood and young adulthood. And so being the director of Billy Graham's crusades, as they were called back in the eighties, switched over in the nineties to missions. Um, being the director meant that my family, we moved every single year, um, in the service of preparing a city for Billy Graham's meeting nights. And if, you know, Randy, if you've ever, if anyone's ever been to a Billy Graham crusade, there are five nights of meetings where Billy Graham speaks and presents an, an invitation to receive Christ. To, he presents the gospel. And um, so what people don't realize is that those crusades took about nine months to organize. It took mm. nine months to organize five nights. Yeah. And, you know, um, I, I don't think people realize, I certainly didn't until I read your book, it meant that some people, and, and in this case, your father and your family, would move to the next city and spend those nine months on the ground. There would be the five-day, five-night event, and then you'd pack up and move again. That's right. And again and yeah. again and again. You moved how many times in your first 20 years of life? Um, I moved 12 times by the time I was 14. Mm. So, and then, of course, some later on, but not having to do with the Billy Graham Crusades. Yeah, 12 times. So we moved every single year, except for one time in the late 80s. We lived in Rochester, New York for two years, and it was so exciting to be such a local. <laughs> well, you know, you you tell that bit in your book so beautifully of here, here's what was different about being in the same place a second year in a row and going back to the same school and people knew you. And at yeah. first day of school was not, oh, who's the new kid? And again, we just take it all for granted. I I grew up in the same town. I didn't move until I went away to college. And so I went to the same elementary school all those years. And I, I just took all that for granted. But then reading your book, um, and you really paint, there was this desperate, I hope that's not too strong. I don't think it is, oh, <laughs> longing for home. Here, lis listen, listeners, uh, here's what uh, Jess writes. Of my parents' four children, I struggled the most to reconcile myself to the transient life we lived for 15 years. Growing up in a Christian home, I knew that I should long for heaven one day. But of all the shoulds of Christianity, this was the one I wrestled with most. I was never very good at longing for a heavenly home because I was too busy longing for an earthly one. Um, uh, tell us more about that. What's, okay. What else is in there? Yeah, uh, you even just hearing you say, "I grew up going to the same high school, the sa the same elementary, the same high school." Even just you saying that now, I'm an adult in my 40s. Even now, it creates this longing in me. I'm jealous of that. Mm, sorry, um, 
<laughs> but 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 people need to hear your story, and they and they yeah. need to hear the larger story of longing for home. But yes. sorry, keep keep diving further in for us. Sure. So I, you know, God wires things in our hearts, and um, as a child, I because we moved every year, I had this longing to be a part of a community, to know the streets, to be known, to have a house that I never had to leave that I knew was mine, that every corner was mine. And I had history with every part of that house. And that was my longing because we would rent a house and it was not ours. And it was, it never felt like ours and the Mm. city never felt like ours. We were truly just passing through. And that, um, I was such a sensitive kid and that created like kind of a, almost a, a chill in me from such a young age I, that I wanted so badly to never leave a place. And um, my longing for home really, it really, it was like it dovetailed completely with a predisposition toward anxiety that I, that I, that I had uh, Mm. still have. I was born with, I was, I I won the genetic lottery, you know, in our family's history of, of (laughs) children struggle with anxiety, you know, um, and um, I had, there were four siblings in our family and, and I was the one who won that lottery. And my siblings seemed not bothered at all with the thought, with the idea that we unpacked boxes huh. every nine months. Hmm. To me, they didn't seem bothered by it at all. I, I, you know, I walked around with all the emotion for everyone, for everyone. And I was so upset by it. It was such a lifestyle that was upsetting to me from such a young age. And so um, I grew up watching people in cities where we lived and watching friends and wishing that I had their lives. All the while they would look at me and think, say, oh my goodness, you just lived in Paris, France. I wish I had your life, you know? Ah, And it it was truly like the grass is always greener. But I think that um, the longing for home was something God just, it was like a a stamp in me that he put in me. Mm. And that longing is what eventually drew me to him and to his word, which when he says, I will come in and I will make my home in you. And that- Ah, good, good. And that to me as as a teenager, hearing those words- uh, which were words, you know, scriptures that I had grown up hearing probably, but my heart was like primed and ready by the time I was uh, 13. And hearing those words, um, and I write about this in the book, a real moment where I had a conversation with with Jesus that, that really had to do with um, – him, him coming in and making his home with me so that I would not be anxious. Mm, yeah. Well, I want to come back to this theme about anxiety and longing for home, but we, but I, I want to step back a little bit. Tell us about how the Beatles and Bob Dylan got into the title and in your book. Right. And in your life. Yeah, that's the, uh, those are the three, those were the three big influences in my childhood because my father was a um, was a convert. My father grew up in in um, Michigan. He grew up. He was a child of the '60s. You know, war protester in college, Vietnam War protester. He was a he was heavy into drugs in college, and he became a Christian really dramatically in college. And he um, he really radically got rid of a lot of influences in his life, drugs, a lot, um, a lot of dark, uh, music and things like that. But he kept one thing and he never let go of his favorite music, which was <laughs> the Beatles and Bob Dylan. Ah, okay. Yes. And so when we would travel from city, truly, when we would travel from city to city, um, by road, if we were, if we were going to be living in a city, um, that we could drive to, we would always have these really ugly, Billy Graham vans. They were like cargo vans. And we had all ride in this cargo van from one city to the next, from the city where we had lived to the city where we we would be moving. And when we would ride in those vans, my father would only ever play the Beatles or Bob Dylan tapes. (laughs) (laughs) And so my little imagination as a child connected Billy Graham 
<laughs> with the Beatles and Bob Dylan. And those things intertwined in my imagination and in my reality. And so I, I truly, I feel that the Beatles music and Bob Dylan, even now when I hear the Beatles and Bob Dylan, I can't turn the radio station. It's like, I've got to let it play. Ah, it's, it's, ah. it's part of, it's just part of the way I think, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and I think uh, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think you, you, you say in the book that, um, so the music provided a kind of home or homeness. I don't know if that, that's not a real word, but uh, a sense of stability in the midst of moving around and traveling in cargo vans or whatever. It's, yeah. oh, there's that song. I know that song. I know, Absolutely. I know the lyrics of that song so well that that is a sense of home. That's um, right. It, exactly. I mean, we all have that experience with music, right? Where we, where we um, hear a song and it takes us back to a certain time yeah. or place or memory. Mm -hmm. And so when we played the, the, when my father would play the music of the Beatles and Bob Dylan, it was like, it was like a bridge. The music was like this bridge from one place to the next. And I could really kind of rest myself in the music. And so the lyrics of um, the Beatles and the lyrics of Bob Dylan, especially in his albums when he became a believer, really became touchstones in my life. And, uh, um, yeah. You know, this is this is important for um, recovering Pharisees like me to hear <laughs> because I, I think I think some people may hear the Beatles. I mean, they were just decadent. I mean, do you know about their lifestyles? Do you know? I mean, you talk about drugs. I mean, they, they didn't just fall into drugs. They celebrated drugs. And and Bob Dylan, I I, I don't know. I, there, there's not enough Tylenol in the world for me to figure out Bob <laughs> Dylan's psyche. So so some of us think, no, you shouldn't listen to that music. Well, um, and, and for some of us, there are certain musics and artists, no, we probably shouldn't listen to, particularly if it takes us to places that yes. are temptations and sinful. But um, uh, part of God's general revelation can be songs, even if they're sung by people who don't share our view about God, but can be, well, th they're capable of producing the good, the true, and the beautiful, even if that isn't necessarily their intent. Um, Absolutely. So I think I said in the book, in all God's mystery, that music became something that helped lead me to him. And I think that there's just a mystery there. You know, I don't mm. I think that we're always, we always want to like put a stamp on something or, or just label something a certain way, but it was a mystery. I don't know why, but that's how God worked. And, you know, he uses so many threads in our lives that we don't even know about to draw mm -hmm. us to him. Yeah. And, and we certainly may not be realizing it at the time. And yeah. then 20 years later, we look back and you go, you know what? There was something going on there. Um, exactly. um, there. There are two Broadway musicals in my mind that God used to draw me to himself. And neither one of them are Christian at all. And Which are was not the intent. So one was Candide with the, the music and drama written by Leonard Bernstein. And then mm -hmm. the other one is Pippin. Uh, music by Stephen Schwartz. Um, I hope I'm getting that right. I think that's right. Um, uh, so they're, they're not Christian musicals at all. They're, they're nothing. But but they both had this wrestling with why are we here? What's the whole point of life? And they both come to conclusions that I found tremendously disappointing. Um, mm. For Candide, it was, well, just make your garden grow. And with Pippin, it's well, just find someone you can love and settle down and have a normal marriage and family. And I remember after both of those with this, really? Is that, that's the best you got? Ah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Um, and then again, uh, uh, it's also for me a whole lot of classical music pieces and concerts that I went to that left me disappointed. So mm -hmm. I, I kept hearing, as I was reading your book, I kept hearing that quote, by C.S. Lewis, that's one of the most important in my life of, if I find in my life uh, a desire which no experience in this life can, in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. 
Yes. And and that is the theme of your book. I, I didn't find home here, 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 here. And it wasn't just because we only stayed around for nine months. It's because right. there can't be a full sense of home there because we're meant for another home. That's right. That's right. And it was, and I think I would have, you know, uh, this is projection, but I, it's almost like I would have, I would have decided I could find a home when we stayed in Philadelphia. I think I would have said, okay, now I'll know what home means. And, and really, really gravitate to that, except that I had anxiety always. And so yeah. the anxiety element is what caused me to need inward, inwardly, a, the peace that I longed for about home. It's like I associated home with a place where, where you would have peace. Mm -hmm. And I thought that as a child, I thought that that peace would come from being in a house that I never had to leave and which... I never, and that, and that knew me, you know, I was always so anxious in cities because I'd sit in the classroom and think, I don't even know how to get back to my house. And I didn't, mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't know the street names. I, and this was, you know, pre internet. So I didn't know street names. I barely knew the phone number of the new house where we were living, mm -hmm. you know? And so I thought that home would be home would give me that internal peace, but it didn't because I, I struggled with anxiety. And so I needed a greater, a greater home. I really needed it. Yeah. And that's, and that's when that's what God continues. This is just a theme. And I, th and you know, the, the older I get, the more I meet people and talk and the people who have read my books, Oh, I gravitated to this topic of this theme of home the more I realized I wasn't the only one. I, I felt like the only one because sure. our lives were sure. so different. Yeah, um, right. But I'm certainly not the only one who's wrestled with this longing for home. Are you ready to grow in your faith? Well, here's a resource that could help you on your spiritual journey. We call it Journey. Uh, it is a nine month small group program designed to help you become a better grounded disciple of Jesus Christ who faithfully follows and actively serves God. Each week, you'll grow through Bible readings and short assignments with uh, world-class teachers. We've put together uh, these resources for you. They're very accessible. And through the journey adventure, you can discover the same joy and power that the early disciples experienced as they followed Jesus. So if you're ready to get started, um, May it be that God would be with you as you explore that. Here's a link. You'll want to go to our website, cslewisinstitute.org slash journey hyphen sign up. I sure hope you got that. Let me repeat it. cslewisinstitute.org slash journey hyphen sign up. Right, right, right. Well, on some level, I think everybody does um, b because we're not made for this world. Yes. But uh, some of us have circumstances that accentuate that. So for yours, mm -hmm. moving around, I, I imagine mm -hmm. there's lots of people who were raised in military families who packed up and moved every three years that they would resonate with this. Or people who, well, we stayed in the same home, but it was volatile and I never knew yes. who was going to be there and who was going to be leaving. And so how, yes. let, let's, let's explore two sides of this. So how did coming to faith uh, help you with anxiety? But then fast mm -hmm. forward to today, um, how do you deal with it now on an ongoing basis? Let's, let's go back in time first. So how did, how did your coming to faith address the anxiety issue? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I got to hear the gospel preached by maybe the best preacher in the world, <laughs> um, Billy Graham. Every yeah. year of my child, every year of my childhood. And I watched, I watched what I said in the book can only be described as a movement of the Holy Spirit. I watched every single year how Billy Graham would preach the gospel and thousands of people's hearts would be moved. And I would watch them come forward and come forward, meaning come get out of their seats in the stadiums and go down to the floor of the stadium 
and I would watch them cry and weep and wrestle with, with the parts of their lives that were just hurting and broken. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it was so marvelous. I never, I, I, I always, I loved every minute of that as a child, but you can watch those things and it not be your story yet, you know? And so it wasn't until I was a teenager and we were living in Scotland and it was all, you know, it was, um, all of the awful things coming together, living in this country where there was no sun and (laughs) the sun (laughs) never did shine. Um, uh, I was 13 going through puberty, you know, and, um, I was constantly longing for home and I, I, I think all those things came together and caused me and, and it would, my anxiety was at a pinnacle that year. Mm. And, uh, so that's when I really, I, I began having more frequent panic attacks. Mm. And mm. if anyone has ever experienced a panic attack, if you have ready, it's like, to- it's truly torture. It's a form of mm. torture. Mm. It wrecks the body. It, it just physically wrecks you. And, um, and, uh, I was having the, having panic attacks more frequently at that time. And I, um, I had, a, a, a an encounter. I had a day in my life at, where I, I write about this in the book where I was in the nurse's, stri- uh, in the, in the nurse's office at my school. And I really cried out to Jesus. And it was, it was the first time that everything clicked the same message that Billy Graham spoke all, all those years was suddenly the message for me. And Mm -hmm. I heard it through the lens of the anxiety. You know, Mm. I need, I need peace. I have to have peace. And so that was the first time I felt that the Lord was saying, I will come in and I will be your peace. I won't Mm. just give it. I will be it in you. Mm. Yeah. And that Um, began, that began my, my real conversion, you know, you know, um, I do think, um, well, it's a peace in the midst of the storm. Um, it's not always the removal of the storm. Um, no. You know, we, we, we know that story where Jesus calmed the storm, and so the storm was over. And we think, that's what I want. I want him to calm the storm. But you kept moving around, and you were going to keep moving around, and those dynamics weren't going to change. Um, but, but I, I think what the Bible teaches, uh, sometimes he takes away the storms. Thanks be to God Mm -hmm. for those times, but, but more often it's a peace, a stability, a, uh, a calm, even while in the periphery, all hell is breaking loose, perhaps in the fullest sense of that. And, um, uh, that that's an important issue. And, you know, there's all sorts of people who are documenting and, and uh, writing that this problem is getting worse. The, the level of anxiety in our world is really rising, particularly among younger people. And there's all sorts of things about social media causing or, or yeah. stimulating or making it worse. Um, and uh, absolutely. And I, um, it didn't, it didn't go I would continue in my life, you know, after that, I, I still wrestle with anxiety and, and particular periods where I am just working all of my tools to keep from having panic attacks. I have, I have, I have struggled with them. Um, in the last two years, I, I've had a couple of panic attacks. And now as an adult, I have all of these tools I've learned, you know, mm-hmm. for for how to help my body because it um, to come to slow down and to work on breath. And I often feel sad when I think about me as a young girl. I wished I wished that there had been someone who could have um bent down and come alongside me and given me just tools for how to, um, truly how to breathe. So through panic and fear. And, um, Mm. I, I'm a teacher by, um, you know, degree that's, that was my degree. And so I would teach in schools and I would watch kids. I've watched kids and thought that child is totally struggling with anxiety Mm. and 
Mm. You know, a lot of times, Randy, kids are labeled ADHD when they actually struggle with, they're struggling with anxiety. It's mm. not, the, the attention deficit is the symptom of anxiety. Oh, okay. Good, good definition there. Good. Yeah. Because kids who are battling anxiety, they often manifest their behavior in the same way as attention deficit. They can't concentrate. They they fly from one thing to the next. They they look tired. They look sleepy. They look distant, removed. Um, they are not sleeping. Um, you know, these are all the things that I definitely experience as a child, and I know that other people are have are and have too. So. Um, yeah. And it's on, you're right. It's on the rise. I, I don't think I can't imagine having, uh, had social media when I was a kid. Mm. Well, so, so say a little bit more about these tools. Give us, give mm -hmm. us one or two tools that you say that you use to help you. I, you know, I truly, I, um, what, one thing that has really worked for me is the, the theory of compartmentalization, this is, again, something I wish I had known as a child, because what we all tend to want to do when a thought is, when we have a thought, a thought comes to us that makes us anxious, we want to unpack it all the way so we can then solve the thought mm, and, yeah, and, yeah. and then be able to be done with it. And then we can say, oh, I, that's the thing I don't have to be anxious about. But we all know that that thinking can grow a thing. Sure. <laughs> you know? Thinking sure. about something tends to make it grow. And so um, I wished that I had been taught younger, but now I know that I can I can train my mind to say, no, I'm not going to think about that topic. Hmm. I can move away from it and I can get busy doing something else. Huh. Particularly something active, something particularly like go take a walk around the block, you know, go um dig up some weeds in the garden, like go cook something, get busy doing something else. And when the thought comes, you gently push it away. And then you also decide on a, this is, this is counterintuitive, but it really helps to decide when you're going to let yourself think about that thought. Oh, like, you schedule it. You schedule it. <laughs> the thinking time truly. And it, and it, I know it sounds strange, but it works. And, and when you say to yourself, no, the time when I'll think about that is when I go to the doctor and that's when I'll talk about the worry that I, that this thing is a cancer or, you know, cause you want to think about it and solve it yourself. But then you, yeah. if you schedule it, if you say, no, I'll call my best friend and that's when I'll talk about it. I'm not going to now. Mm. We, we, you can kind of like. I know this is a weird word, but you can kind of like suffocate the anxiety and put it in its place, <laughs> you know? Oh, um, man, this is really helpful. I, um, oh. you know, there's, there's two thoughts that come to mind for me. Um, one is that, that uh, there's two scriptures that come to mind. One is uh, cast all your cares upon the Lord. So there are times when I have to say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not qualified to take on mm. this issue. I'm yeah. going to cast this upon the Lord and and then take a moment of, you know, he can handle this. He, yes. he can handle this. So Lord, I'm casting this on you. If there are parts of this that I need to deal with, solve or whatever, then uh, cast those parts back to me. Usually oh. it's, okay, He's he's taking care of this. Because I, I have to, I have to dethrone myself <laughs> yes. of thinking I'm capable of resolving world peace issues. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> that's so. Tough. And then the other scripture I wonder if you were going to say is take every thought captive. Oh, good, good, good. Say and more about that. I was not going to talk about that, but yes, please do. And that one goes with this idea of compartmentalization. Take the thought captive and put it where it belongs. It does not belong on your on your horizon right now. Mm -hmm. Take it captive, put it in its place. And and it really helps to have sort of a visualization in your own yes. mind. Yeah. You know, where you put that. Is that you put that in uh for children it helps them to think of put it in a box and lock it. You know? Okay. Okay. Um, 
And then when it's time to to talk about it, we can take it out and we can look at it. Yeah. And what, what is so amazing about the human mind that God has created is that by the time it's time to talk about it, usually you are have a different perspective in your because you got busy doing something else. So yeah, but I, I, want, um, I, I, I it does seem to me though that we need to be careful. You, you're not just saying, "Oh, I have to distract myself." It's not that. No, it's no, no. I'm taking this thought captive and saying, "I don't need to address this." Now I'm going to address right. it another time, and I'm going to do right. other things, but not as an escape, but as a, mm-hmm. a conscious decision of here's how I need to deal with this anxiety. That's right, exactly. Because sometimes we need to. I my tendency is always to, and maybe you feel this too, and others do too. That when a thought makes me anxious, I go into this very alone space. Where mm. it's like I am, I am blind to the rest of the world. All I can do is is sort of obsess over this thing that's making me anxious. Mm. You know, yeah. And so by putting it by putting it in its place, I then have the then I have the control to say, I'll invite someone later to talk about this with me. You know, maybe it's a pastor or a, a trusted friend or something. But I'm going to put this over here and. And I'm going to get busy doing something else until it's the right time to allow someone else. And maybe that's just a prayer time with the Lord, you know, um, invite uh, communication about this topic that's making me anxious. So, Yeah. Oh, I, I Again, taking the thought captive, there could be a sense of, you know what, I, I'm not going to be able to handle this just on my own. And there's yeah. nobody here right now who can help me. So I'm going to put it over there. I'm going to okay. schedule an appointment to deal with it later with mm-hmm. a certain mm-hmm. person who's very helpful. Because sometimes just thinking out loud with it and having exactly. the other person listen and look and say, oh, yeah, I could see why this is difficult. But how about this angle? And they're looking at an angle that you didn't see. Absolutely. Um, and absolutely. And that's where, um, you know, I... I'm a big proponent of counseling. Counseling's been a good friend of mine. Um, good, a good Christian counselor who can, who can, who you can really share with and um, be honest about the things that make you anxious. It's amazing how just hearing yourself say things out loud to someone who is really listening can really open up, open up space where you didn't think it was possible, <laughs> you know. We here at the C.S. Lewis Institute are very excited about a new monthly publication we are launching and have launched already uh, and have sent out a few issues. Uh, In the legacy of C.S. Lewis, this new publication, which we're calling Challenging Questions, tackles subjects and issues regarding the Christian faith with a, hopefully, winsome and thoughtful approach to provide believers with good reasons for their faith and to provide seekers and skeptics with some food for thought. This new publication will be distributed monthly. We hope that you'll uh, share copies of it with uh, friends of yours, neighbors, colleagues. Go to our website, look for challenging questions. There's also a place where you could send us uh, feedback and comments about it. Maybe you could offer some possible topics you'd like to see us address. So we really hope that this uh, resource helps you as you reach out to people who are posing challenging questions to you. Yeah, or they ask a question that digs into a certain aspect of it that, oh, I hadn't even thought to ask that question, but okay, let's, yeah. By the way, you said about visual (laughs) images. Um, One that's very helpful for me, there are times when if I'm facing a very complex situation and I'm feeling overwhelmed um, by anxiety or fear about it, it's because I'm taking on too many aspects at once. It's like, well, who's going to pay for this? And when am I going to have the time for this? And And for me, it helps to think of a bookshelf with lots of different books on there. And each book is a different aspect of this complex issue. And you know what? The problem is all the books are falling off of the shelf at the same time and they're burying me. I need to just put them back up there 
and say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to take one of these books off the shelf right now. And let me look at this aspect of it and pray through that. Not and I and there's the other ten books up on the shelf, and I'll I'll get to those. That's yes. a very helpful image for me. It is. It's funny you say about the books idea because about when B. Sterling and I were uh, when my husband and I were dating, and uh, it was this question of like, is this the person I'm supposed to marry? You know that. <laughs> That question gave me such enormous, it, it really, it was like, it lit the fire under the ang- anxiety part of me. And mm. I struggled deeply with anxiety about that. And mm. then I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't sleeping well. And then as the tricky mind works, my I started to get anxious about sleeping. And if you've ever... <laughs> If you have the pleasure of being someone who's ever been worried about sleeping, you know that it is its own self-fulfilling nightmare, sure. right? It because this cycle that just keeps getting worse and worse. Worse and worse. And so I found myself when B and I were engaged, I was just in the worst cycle of sleep anxiety mm. and mm. and I couldn't see how to get out. It was like I was stuck and I couldn't extract what was the main problem and what was the secondary problem and it was the secondary problem of sleep became the main problem. You know, I was concerned that I, about the will of God, should I marry this person? But in my worries at night, sleep became the main thing, you know, the main problem. So anyways, I, one thing a counselor said that was so helpful to me again about compartmentalizing. And she said, you're allowed to leave the library called sleep, Jess. You're allowed to leave that space that you keep thinking about constantly, Mm, mm. you're allowed to leave it. And it was like the imagery I needed. Like, Mm. I don't, I've read everything now about sleep. I've talked about it so much. I've counted how many hours I'm getting, you Mm. know, she's, and she's like, I think it's time to just leave the library. (laughs) Mm, Nice. Well, um, this is really very helpful. And I'm sure that, um, uh, well, I'm not sure, but I would certainly imagine that a whole lot of our listeners are, are dealing with this issue. You know, um, anxiety is, is addressed in the scriptures quite often. And um, you get the idea that if it's a- addressed this often, well, it's probably a common problem. And in fact, maybe it's the essential problem of the fact that we are spiritual beings living in a physical world where eternal beings living in a temporal world. And this place is not the place of ultimate peace and at-homeness. So of course there's going to be anxiety. Um, Mm. Well, I want to, I want to go after one other aspect um, that's, that's not, it's not really addressed in your book, but I kept thinking it as I was reading it. So I would imagine if there was somebody else in your situation who traveled around this much with this Billy Graham thing and he had a different city, different city, and it caused so much anxiety, I would imagine that some person might go, I'm done with this Christian stuff. It just wrecked my life. I don't want anything to do with it. Mm-hmm. But you didn't. You didn't. You you came to faith and you stuck with it. Um, uh, is it okay to go here with this, this question yes. of... What, why did you stick with it? Why didn't you run away? And if there's someone who's listening who that that's what they're tempted with, you know, that there's a whole lot of this Christian stuff that really caused a lot of problems for me. Uh, I'm I'm thinking about bailing on it. What have, why did you stay and what might you say to someone else in that situation? Well, I truly I I think it as I've said, my experience with Christ has always come back. It always comes back to him being the peace in this world for me. Mm, I'm, good, good. I'm someone who's so rattled by, by this world. And I think maybe I'm just an overly sensitive person, but Christ dwelling in me is the only peace that is truly like the only peace I've ever experienced that Mm -hmm. lasts and is true. And it, it resonates like a drum, you know, it's like, 
I, so I look at, I look at people in my life. I look at just like the moms in my neighborhood and they're, and they're struggling. They're struggling with anxiety and wanting peace. And so I have tried and to, and they've all read my book. So, uh, I have tried and I continue to talk to them about Christ is my only peace. Like, yeah. Good. You know, I, I, I hope it's okay, but I, I think maybe that's the place for us to, to uh, bring this to a close. Are you okay about that? And, uh, yeah, I hope I answered some questions. Well. Yeah. Oh, very much so. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I found this, this, uh, your, your book is great. I'm going to put the link in the show notes. Um, I think this, this longing for home might be a, a theme we use more and more for talking to people, uh, about the gospel, because I think people will resonate with it. They'll say, that's it. You put your finger on it. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I thought I was going to find it in a person or a job or a place or an experience. Mm -hmm. And no, those things are pointers to the fact that there's a greater person we're longing to connect with and a bigger place that God has prepared for us. I know exactly. Randy, I would even encourage you use it as like a, use it as a, a, a like one of those, STEM questions, like what does longing for ultimate home look like for you? Mm, you know, mm, good because it is written in our DNA. This is, this is how we're wired. You know, just last night I drove through my neighborhood and I saw someone's open window, their living room window, and they had already put up their uh, Christmas tree, which I have issues with, you know, another topic entirely, but I saw the Christmas tree in the window and it hit me again. Like it just Hit me in the chest, the longing for home. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. The Christmas tree in the window, you know? How about we that? All want to be, we all want to be invited into that. That's that's a symbol of our longing right there. Right. You know? Well, well, this has been great and great fun. And I'm going to uh, uh, recommend your book to people um, and recommend that more and more of us explore this idea that we have a greater mm -hmm. home and that this home that we have here has all sorts of nice things about it and gifts about it, but they are not the final um, uh, stop on the journey and they point uh, to the ultimate. Again, I That's keep right. coming back to that same C.S. Lewis quote that uh, we were meant for another world. And that's just such a beautiful yeah. image. Well, there's this is so been much fun. Oh, go ahead. Yes, it's please. It's been so fun. I was going to say, there's so much more I could talk to you about. I have, um, I, I also was a part of a project about three years ago. I, I, uh, I joined with a great photographer and a, and a filmmaker here in Austin. And we interviewed over 40 adult refugees from around the world who have been resettled in Austin. And again, the Lord used my longing and my t this theme of home was why I realized I even wanted to be part of this project because here are people that have been displaced. Yes, truly. And now are hoping to find a new home. And, um, and God did a lot of um, work in my life over that course of talking to refugees and telling my heart how much he loves refugees. And... Um, and their longing for home is something that points to God. So, hmm. well, maybe we need to have another conversation sometime and talk about this refugee pro uh, pro yeah. project that you're involved yeah. in. Um, yeah. I'll send you the link to it. You can see it all online. Great. Well, to our listeners, I want to say thank you for tuning in, if that's a, an accurate term. Um, we hope that our uh, resources at our website are really helpful for you in your own personal discipleship. May the Lord use uh, our work together so that uh, we all would love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Thanks. Thanks.